A reading tonight, the passage we'll be looking at, I'd like to direct your attention to, is Daniel chapter 3, uh, chapter, verses 19 to 25. I'll read these for us and then introduce uh, some of the comments for tonight. You may be familiar with this story of some faithful uh, Jews in the fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent that the furnace, uh, and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as I said, we're starting a new series uh, tonight on how to deal with pain, how to deal with pain. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, how to deal with pain in despair, in, in sickness, in relationships, how to deal with pain when we're overwhelmed with life or a situation in life. But tonight, from this passage in Daniel, we'll deal with the topic of how to deal with pain in trials. Now, as we begin this new series, I'd like to jump right to the very end of the series. <laughs> we have six sermons or six teachings ahead of us on this talk, but topic of how we deal with pain in our lives, suffering in our lives, when, when, when something affects us deeply and causes us hurt and pain in one way or another. I'd like us to skip right to the very end of this series and give you the answer that I hope you will all hear uh, throughout this series and also take home with you and take into your life as you continue to walk and, and aim to follow Jesus faithfully and deal with the difficulties that life sometimes in God's providence throws at us. And the end of this series, I want you to remember Isaiah 61 and verse 3. And this promise from the Lord our God about how he will ultimately deal with all of our pain and suffering and every tear. Isaiah 61, verse 3, going to the end of this series. And now provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Whatever uh, pain you may be going through or have gone through or will go through in your life, uh, can you hear as we begin this series, the end, which is the promise of God to take all of our pain and all of our tears, to transform them eventually for his good and for his final purpose that we see at the end of those verses. I hope as we look at how to deal with pain, you will hear mostly uh, about the promises of the Lord our God. C.S. Lewis, of course, has one of the most famous quotes about pain <laughs> in life. Uh, and you may have heard this. It's, it's so apropos that I want to share it with you. He says, we can ignore pleasure. I'm not sure. I don't think I have this on the slides. We can ignore pleasure, he writes in his book, The Problem of Pain. But pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciences, but shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Well, as we look at the Passage tonight from Daniel chapter 3, I'd like us to consider how to deal with pain 
in a one particular kind of area and way, and that is how to deal with pain in trials. And I want to look at three, four very brief points with you, and I have my timer set so we don't go too long. The first point is, and are they up there? Realize there are different kinds of suffering. Uh, number two, accept that we are not often saved from the pain in a, in a, in a trial. Uh, remember that God has entered into our suffering and always keep walking. Okay, the very first point then, uh, as we look at this passage, the first point is realize there are different kinds of suffering. That's verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This sounds maybe, I don't know if I should, can say this in a sermon up here or not, but when I was a kid in the Presbyterian church, we memorized, do you guys learn this as in your own uh, how to memorize these people's names, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bungalow. Shad, you, oh, you didn't. That's how I memorized as a kid, learned those names. But those faithful Jews, here they are, living in a foreign country, in a foreign land. And verse 19, it says, his attitude toward them changed. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time to get into, into that, but just the, 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 the chapter just before this, as that chapter unfolds, King Nebuchadnezzar is asking them to bow down before a great statue of him to compromise their own Christian convictions and to basically bow down and worship before him. And there's a situation here that, is, that gives us the nature of the suffering, the nature of the situation that they are in. The attitude of the king has changed. And, and, and what the king has, has said to them, the, the situation that's changed, uh, is, is we can see it a little bit earlier, basically Nebuchadnezzar is furious with them that they will not bow down before him. He says, there are Jews that you have set over the affairs of, uh, of your kingdom who pay no attention to you. They neither, neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. And so the nature of the suffering of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this situation, the nature and source of the pain in their own life and situation in this instance is a trial, is a life trial. And that's a whole category of, of, of a situation that can lead to pain in our lives, this outward set of circumstances that presses in on them, challenging their faith, challenging their convictions, egging them, trying to force them to compromise, and they feel and experience around them repercussions for not caving in in this situation but standing unstead firm. And we'll see how they stand firm. And in verse 16, he, they have this wonderful bit of, I'm not going to read all those verses, but you can scan them in your Bibles, how they will not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar no matter what may happen to them in the furnace, whether God decides to pull them out of the furnace and save them or not. And so this is a kind of suffering that is a trial. And the image in the verse here, or the actual real trial in the verse, the outcome of it, the pain they feel, in verse 19, he orders them to, to heat the furnace seven times hotter than usual, which is just unbelievably hot, the hottest it can possibly get. And in Scripture, we, we find, this is an actual story in, in, that happened in time and space, the furnace, the fire, the suffering, but that also in the Bible is an image Fire is an image and a, a word picture for trials that the person of faith, that the Christian may go through, that God's will may go through. And in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 20, uh, there, the, the slavery in the time of um, Egypt is seen and referred to as a fiery affliction, a, fire of, a fiery furnace of affliction for them. In 1 Peter um, chapter 1, we hear about the fiery ordeal that God's people are going through there. And so the first thing about how to deal with pain, I think, in our lives is for us to realize the kind of suffering that is before us, the kind of difficulty that is before us. And that can be so difficult and so hard when we're in the middle of a situation and it feels like our world may be spinning or being turned upside down. But it's important for us to try, as we deal with pain, to know what kind of situation we're going through in biblical categories. 
And this biblical category of trial is a very rich category in Scripture. And if we can identify it uh, through uh, counsel of others and prayer, it's going to help us in dealing with it. Because we know through Scripture that um, the, 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 the fire of a trial, uh, the fiery furnace of, the, 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 of affliction and trial is seen in Scripture and revealed in Scripture that if we believe in Jesus if we trust him in our affliction, if we trust him in our time of trial, when things are pressing in against us, when we trust him in the time of fire in our lives, then that suffering in power, Tim Keller writes in his amazing book on which a lot of this series is based, he writes, our suffering in pain will relate to our character the same way that fire relates to gold. That is that we will be refined. So we need to realize first, the kind of suffering that we're facing. And here it is a trial. Number two, second point, is we need to accept that we are not often saved from the pain. Verse 22, we see the king's command was so urgent, the fire was so hot, the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took them up. Uh, we thought Nebuchadnezzar had power, but his own soldiers die take them up, and they put these three men firmly tied, and they put them into the blazing furnace. Were you kind of hoping that as you read this story, they were going to walk up to the furnace and like an angel would snatch them out of there and not put them into the fiery furnace? Maybe if you're reading that for the first time, you might hope that's going to be, it's, uh, it's the Bible after all, right? We hope it's going to be something like that, but the story teaches us something even deeper, <laughs> even more, and that is we need to consider accepting in this life that we are not often, if ever, saved from the pain of a trial or a situation. These men get put right into that fire. And I think that as we deal in our lives, we often, I think, maybe assume that we'll have no pain in our lives. Or maybe even more than that, we, we maybe think that we deserve to not have any pain in our life? Or, or, or maybe we, we believe the lie that God doesn't love me or care for me if I suffer? <laughs> or God must not be a good God if these things are happening, bad, difficult trials are happening in my life. We, we can try to work around that and get into these mental gymnastics and we forget, I think, that throughout Scripture, the Christian life is described as a struggle. The Christian life is described as a battle. The Christian life is, is described often as a hard road, a narrow gate on which, on which to walk and on which to go. And so why must we us uh, kind of uh, sometimes we can assume we can assume that this should not be part of my life that there's no way God would do this to me that this cannot happen to me but we need to accept i think in the in the witness of scripture that this having pain dealing in times of trial specifically when circumstances are against us are part of our life on this earth and the bible is not about avoiding pain. The God of the Bible is not about running away, of course, from pain. But Jesus is the one who enters the brokenness of this world. Unlike any other world religion, we may study and becomes the God who is wounded. So, that's the second point. Running out of time. We're going to keep rolling here. Third point, real quick. If I can say this one, how to deal with pain. Remember um, that God is, I just said this, maybe as I repeated myself. Remember that God has entered into suffering with you. And we see that in verse um, 24. King Nebuchadnezzar looks, leaps up onto his feet in amazement. Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. And for us, this is meant to be uh, a comfort, uh, a promise that God is with us in times of trial. 
This may be the pre-incarnate Jesus in the fire. This may be a heavenly visitor in the fire. Whatever it may be, it is meant for us to read and see and understand the promise that God is faithful and present in trial. That he understands what we may be going through in a time of trial. That we can depend on God in situations of hardship. That we can live and we can have a mindset as if there is hope in a time of trial and difficulty, that we can speak to God, that we can pour out our hearts to Him, that we can trust Him, that He is the God who has entered into our world and He is, he, 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 he is here, He is not absent. Richard Baxter, in one of his books on the Christian life, says God does not lead us into any dark rooms that Jesus Himself has not already walked through. And we see this promise of the living God in Isaiah chapter 48, which I wish to just briefly read for us, about being with us, deeply with us, the one we can turn to and speak to and be encouraged by in our times of trial. Chapter 48, where am I? Um, I'm going to have to get this for you. Sorry, I look over. Oh, 10, do I have it? Oh, yes. No, it's not there. Pardon me. It is there. I just don't know where it is. Oh, there it is, 43. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, and your Savior. I will be with you. And so we're, it's so easy in times of trial when everything is spinning and we feel pressed down and crushed. It's so easy for us to start meditating on the wrong things, to let our minds wander to how powerful that thing out there is in the world that is pressing in upon me, and we, we forget. As I said this morning in another sermon, we, we don't breathe the rarefied air of the strong promises of God's protection and blessing. You know... <laughs> As we enter deep into that kind of a situation, I think, I mean, I, we've all learned different things, but one thing I've learned, I shared with the seniors, with Pastor Bill on Thursday, the seniors lunch was, I think as we let that promise sink very deeply into our lives, there can be, there can be, a, there can be a situation, I think, where we can almost, and we see it in the Bible too, we can almost be thankful for the trials that God sends our ways, for how they change us and how we learn about God in them. Uh, we can be thankful in them, and we can be thankful for them because God uses those things as we, he meets us in the valley of the shadow of death, as he meets us there. Uh, we, we learn um, our greatest lessons sometimes in life in the greatest pain that we that, that, we, that we experience. So some of the most important things that we understand about God and ourselves, we only, only learn in the greatest, uh, some of the greatest gifts we get from God, we only receive in times of the greatest suffering, difficulty, and trial. And I said to those uh, seniors on Thursday, I said, about a year ago at this time, or maybe 14 months ago at this time, I and my, some people in my family have been experiencing a a, a pretty, uh, pretty intense trial, probably for me, probably one of the most intense trials I had ever gone through as a person. And somebody, a friend of mine, I thought he was a friend, uh, called me up kind of a year ago, maybe 14 months ago, uh, when things were kind of at a climax of this particular trial in my life uh, around convictions and, and just all kinds of things. And you know what he called me up? This guy, he's, he's an older gentleman, love this guy. And... Uh, he said to me, Greg, I know you're going through like a trial. And he said, uh, he said something like, have you thanked God <laughs> for the gift of, uh, of the trial you're going through? And I said, I said, oh, we'll see. And I, said, I, said, I thought this guy was my friend. I said, like, it wasn't a very nice thing for him to say. <laughs> Greg, have you thanked God for the suffering you're going through? I'm like, no, I haven't. That's not very nice of you. What are you doing? I'm not thankful for this. Ah, but looking back on that now, I can tell you 
for my own life, wow, I can say that I am. I think I can say that I am thankful. He was spiritually years ahead of me. We may find ourselves in the heat, in the fire, but the promise of God is that the heat will not be in us, consume us, take us over, but will change us for God's glory. Finally, how to deal with pain. Uh, what's the first point? Give me a second. Okay. Realize there are different kinds of suffering, except we're not often saved for the pain. Remember that God has entered into suffering with us. And finally, can I just say two minutes? Always keep walking through the pain you're in. Always keep walking. And we see that uh, in verse 25. Four men are walking around. And Tim Keller in his book on suffering and pain uses this as a great image for the end of his book. Always keep on walking. That is, always keep moving forward. If you're in a time of trial and it's like your life is stopped because of that trial, just remember the only way is forward. That in Scripture we're called not to avoid pain, but to move through pain intentionally, deliberately, called to see God's somehow God's purpose, God's healing, God's comfort in it for his ends. What does it mean to walk with God through pain? Well, it's, it's a rhythm to walking. If you're a physiotherapist or something like that, if I were to walk across the stage, you might be able to recognize me by my gait or someone far away because of the rhythm of how they walk. There is a recognizable rhythm to the Christian walk that can get out of sync in times of trial, but we're called to keep on walking. Whatever it is, keep on moving forward, reading our Bibles, praying, reading through the Psalms, obeying God's Word, talking to other Christian friends, finding the counsel of others, talking to Pastor Bill, if you haven't already, so wise, committing everything to the Lord, uh, contemplating where Christ is in all of this, all of those Christian disciplines, all of those Christian rhythms. We mustn't let those go, but just to deliberately keep moving forward, trusting that Christ the Good Shepherd is walking with you. I'll end with a poem, <laughs> one little poem at the end. It's gone so fast, our time is up. One writer from the first, war, first World War says, The other gods were strong, but thou, O Lord, was weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds only God's wounds can speak. And not a god has wounds, but thou alone. Can we pray? Gracious Father, we thank you for the scriptural witness and teaching on how to deal with pain in times of trial. We thank you for the, the witness of these faithful people of God in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, who walks with us. I pray for uh, each of us and anyone tonight who is going through a serious trial in life, set off by external circumstances, pressing in on their own convictions, looking for compromise or surrender to the world, that you may indeed, Lord, strengthen them. May they know the company of the communion of saints, the presence and help of the Holy Spirit, the steadfast presence of Jesus Christ, our truest friend and brother. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, let's see what we have here. Yeah, a couple of questions. Thank you for these. Uh, scripture describes... We're doing questions, yes. Scripture des- describes the Christian life as a battle. Should I be concerned or feel guilty if my Christian life has been, be, been quite pain-free? Well... No, I don't think you should feel guilty. No, I don't think we should feel guilty if our lives have been uh, filled with relative ease. I mean, uh, I think all of us maybe in this part of the Western world might be in the same boat in this sense. Um, We're talking about suffering and pain, uh, you know, in the global context. So many of us in this part of the world uh, have all of our basic needs uh, met and maybe haven't truly experienced suffering as others have around the world. Um, I, I would say, though, that, uh, yeah, I think the thing that should make us feel guilty would be if we're breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Um, I don't think that we need to feel guilty uh, for the fact that um, our life has gone without any major uh, bits of suffering, trial, or pain. Uh, I think we can give thanks to God for, for, for that. We can give thanks to God for uh, the prosperity and for the adversity when that comes, and I think maybe we could spend some of our time, if you're in that particular place in life, of preparing for times of adversity, suffering, and pain, uh, because we know that those, it's, we will, uh, that is part of the Christian life and witness, as we see in Scripture, and it would be very hard to live our whole lives without any significant trial at all. Um, if necessary, can you unpack being grateful for suffering? Would that also be included being grateful for evil? Um, well, I don't think we need to be grateful for the devil or for the force of evil in the world. I think we can be grateful for a God who is provident and sovereign over all and is able in Isaiah 61 to turn uh, pain for his purposes and transform evil for his good. Um, Yeah, here's a similar question, I think, to that. It doesn't seem right to thank God for uh, every trial or pain, for example, addictions, uh, loss of a child or disease. Isn't it more correct to thank God for walking with us, yeah, and not leaving us alone in that pain? It seems twisted to thank, think, uh, thank God for pain itself. Well, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I guess we, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think when we're looking maybe back on a situation of great, in this instance tonight when I was talking about trials, um, you know, I think you can look back on those times, I think with a different view to maybe when you're right in them, it's a lot more raw and difficult when you're in them. Yeah, we don't think or believe that it's God's will to bring um, uh, necessarily for evil to prevail, uh, but I think we do have to I think in the biblical view, I think we do have to be grateful that God is in control of the sweeping events of history and even down to our very lives and not easily disconnect God's action and presence in time and history and from just our own experience. Probably was a very convoluted answer. There's a whole bunch more questions. How should one as a Christian respond when in the middle of trials... It feels impossible to feel God's presence. How should one as a Christian respond in the middle of trials when it feels? Well, that's a really good question, too. What if we can't feel God's presence at all? What if God seems absent? And that's something we're going to look at next week in in Psalm 88 when we're feeling overwhelmed by suffering. But I think that's a very, very common experience in times of suffering. It's one of the things that suffering does is it makes God feel absent. What does one do? Well, one could name it. We'll talk about it next week more, but one needs to, I think, name it, uh, that I do feel God is absent, and one needs to, I think, try to prioritize the significance, and it's hard, of feelings and and, and how we're feeling about the absence of God, uh, as opposed to what we hear in the community of saints and the witness of Scripture and the company of other Christians about 
the great faithfulness and presence and working of God independent of our own feelings. That's a hard one. We're going to talk about that next week a bit more. And do you still believe in healing? Yes, I do. I still believe in healing. Um, there's a verse that comes to mind, Malachi 4, 2, that came to mind in the song, actually before someone sent that question. I do still believe in healing, yes. Malachi 4, 2, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healings in its rays. You know, I, I, do, I do believe God is at work in his church and in the lives of his people, uh, bringing healing from, from difficult times, uh, bringing comfort, uh, refining us, changing us, making us more like Christ, healing our wounds, binding up our bombs, uh, our wounds with bombs. Um, uh, I think of the story of the uh, good, good Samaritan. I think of, I think of the, 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 the Samaritan who found the man on the side of the road, beaten, broken, uh, injured. An image, it can be an image for what life can do to us, and that Samaritan can be one who points us to Jesus Christ, who picks us up, who binds up our wounds, who puts us on, <laughs> carries us, puts us on as a story, in the don is there a donkey in that story? But carries us to, to the inn of his grace, to the healing of the place of his church, and who, uh, who desires for us to be, made, to be made whole. Thank you so much for those questions. I, I, I hope I answered those faithfully. Uh, we'll have lots more time in the next few Sunday nights to think about this topic, and I'll try to pick up on some of these things that you've said in the questions and maybe answer them a bit more fully uh, next uh, Sunday night, God willing.